I know. Okay, check. There's audio. Thank you so much. We have uh, at the very end of the day, we have what we call conversation groups. It's a small group discussion where we ask folks to join with others who have a common aspect of the illness. So usually what we the groups that we typically wind up with are one or two groups of folks who have brainstem lesions, a group of folks who have multiple lesions, a parents group, a caregivers group, and a group of people who Whatever, they have seizures. Um, can I watch? I, I need to know about how we're breaking out here. Um, can I see how many parents or people who have been interested in a parents group who are here? One, two, three, four. Okay. We got Tracy Ocean Oh, this is me. Yeah, I'll get this. Okay. Um, how many folks are interested in a brainstem group? Okay, how many are in care caregivers group? Okay, this is working out very nicely. The groups that are relatively equally sized. And then the last one would be a senior group. All right. I need a volunteer to run the brainstorm group because all right. And a volunteer for the senior we're set that we have to get a little bit of a little bit of a a we are going to talk about drug development this afternoon. So we have a couple uh, special guests to join us, and we're looking forward to hearing from them and continue our great conversation that we had this morning. And you know, feel free to continue to ask questions and share stories, and we'll have time for a science game for breakout later today to really dive in deeper into story sharing and um, questions of that sort. So, so again, we're going to be hearing from uh, Matt Avenanti and Tim Constantine, who represent two pharmaceutical companies that are developing new medication targeted specifically at CC. So we're really excited to hear from you still. Uh, we'll start off with Dr. Matt Avenanti. He's the Director of Research and Project Management at Bioaxon Biosciences. He holds a PhD in Neurobiology and Behavior from Cornell. In the last year, through interviews, Matt has spent time getting to meditation families to help understand the daily situation of, of the CCM community, including the natural variation of the illness. We appreciate the care he's taken to understand patient experiences and priorities of bioaxone seeks to move their medication BA1049 from bench to the bedside. The title of Matt's presentation today is Drug Development Pathway, a role for the angioma, or for the, uh, angioma community. So let's welcome Matt. Hello, everybody. Whoa. Too loud? All right, good. Uh, well, Tony, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Tony, thank you for inviting me to come talk and being such a great facilitator and in introducing me to so many people in the community. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a different, uh, different view on things than you might have heard earlier. Uh, as you know, I'm from, which introduction was, I'm from a pharmaceutical company. We're a small company, I prefer biotech, sometimes <laughs> our company gets a different uh, connotation. Uh, but we, we, have, uh, we have a drug that we're developing uh, for use in angio. Uh, and I'm gonna give you what I think would help the community the most, which is a pretty high level overview of drug development uh, in general, and a little bit of in specific our drug. I'll talk a little bit about what we know 
a high level about our drug. I'm not going to go crazy into the science because I, I know how people's eyeballs glaze over once I really get into pathways and all that stuff. But I hope to, to arm you with a little more understanding of the hurdles and the challenges that, uh, that uh, you have to overcome to move a drug into the clinic and start, and start giving it to people. Um, and then also at the end, I, I think what's the most important thing is I'm going to talk about the, um, the role that the community has, that this wonderful community, and this is a very uncommon patient community in the most positive way, the role that you guys can play in helping us, the companies that are developing, uh, that are developing these drugs specifically for, uh, for injuries. Uh, so I have conflicts of interest. I work for a company that's developing a drug for um, And I have an interest in it because I'm paid by that. Uh, uh, these are the people that I work with. We've been funded uh, very generously by the NIH and the NIDS uh, for small business innovation research grants, both phase one and phase two, for doing a lot of the preclinical work on this drug. Uh, and then in the spirit of what was discussed this morning, if you were at that really wonderful talk at the beginning of the morning, um, a lot of our work has been a collaboration between our company and a number of academic groups that are, uh, well, especially very active in the field. Uh, Dr. Awad's group at the University of Chicago, Dr. Marjorie's group at uh, Duke University, Rebecca Sockton at UCLA. Um, and that's all I've been getting to on that. So, in general, how do we get into medicine? And how do we get from an idea to a new medicine that people can actually take? Um, and I put together a very generalized pathway that you might see different places and maybe broken up a little differently early on, but uh, we're going to use this to, to uh, work our way through the pathway. And so one major thing that I want everybody to take away from this talk is the difference between preclinical and clinical. So you'll hear a lot about clinical trials and you'll hear a lot about things about preclinical. And up until a certain point, there are preclinical trials that are entirely done outside of humans. So they're done whether they're done in vitro, which means in a dish of cells, whether they're isolated from people or some other type of cells. Um, there's animal models that are used. Uh, animal research is very important in drug development. Uh, and then once you get to a point at which the FDA feels comfortable but there is not a high probability that your drug will be dangerous to keep and that then will actually be tolerable. Then the FDA will give you the green light to go ahead and start uh, the actual clinical trials and give them to people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. That's a really big deal because a lot of times I talk to friends and family about what I do, I talk about the preclinical research we do, and they go, Oh, well, when when can I join your study? You know, okay, I, I want it to be tomorrow if possible, but there are steps for all of these compounds that need to be taken, all the, all the, the, the new compounds need to be taken before, we, uh, before we're able to put it into, to put that there. Um, so, let's start with discovery. So, you got an idea, you got a disease you want to fight, you have to know a little bit about the biology. You actually, as you guys are learning, if you listen to the researcher talks ever, you don't have to know everything about the biology of the disease. And in fact, with biology, it's usually the more you learn, the less you know. Okay. <laughs> so all it does, and all uh, trust me, I, I, I know it, all it does is the more you learn, the more you go, oh, I gotta learn this now, I gotta go in this direction. And part of the challenge of early discovery research is focusing on something. And not just saying, uh, hey, this is kind of cool, let's go over here. Let's dabble around this for a couple of years. And so if you have to be focused to learn exactly, to learn something about the biology so that you can actually start to affect the disease or the symptoms of the disease. Um, and so some of those questions are what sorts of genes are involved in the disease? What sort of proteins are involved in the disease? Um, and I'm just talking in a very general role, but we know here that uh, in CCM, there's a number of genes that can carry a mutation that can eventually cause the disease. Um, some diseases are not that clear cut. Um, and uh, even when it's something like 
a CCM where it seems clean cut, it's not always that simple, right? It's not as simple as we might want it to be. So we define the genes, the CCM of genes code for a protein, or for, they code for proteins. And so maybe those proteins could be a target. So um, can any of these be targeted by a drug? Another thing about drug development is that in the vast, vast majority of cases, the drug, the drug development is very good at inhibiting proteins. We're very good at inhibiting them. We are not very good at activating them, not as well. There are examples of activating them. But what drug development is really good at is taking something, basically attaching it to a protein and making protein not work very well. So to, uh, to sort of extrapolate the CCM, where we have a protein that's not working very well, but we don't have that much, Sometimes simply finding a molecule that would bind a CCM might actually not help because we're just really good at inhibiting things. And we already have too little CCM activity. Okay, so can any of these proteins actually be targeted by a drug? There are proteins that are really easy to target with a drug because they have a nice little binding pocket there that you can fit something into. And there are some that are just big blocks that maybe you don't even know how they work. So that's a typical target. Okay. Again, I'm just going to do general for now and then we'll sort of backtrack and I'll talk a little bit about target. So then you have to develop a drug candidate. You have to find something that, that, that binds to the drug and then you go to the, to the uh, protein. And then you also have to find it has to not only bind, but it has to inhibit, it has to do something to it. Okay. And those can be, they fall into three categories. These categories are actually expanding now in the last 10 to 15 years. They used to, pretty much all drugs used to be what are called small molecules, which is little chemical. I have an example of them up there. That little tiny thing that looks like, why did he make it so small? This guy right here, that's aspirin, okay? A little tiny thing, why didn't I zoom in on it? Okay, that's a small molecule. Our drug is a small molecule. Uh, the drug that Tim's gonna talk to you about is a small molecule. There are other drugs now, and they are becoming more and more uh, common and more and more blockbuster, and they're antibodies. And why did I make aspirin so small? That's what an antibody looks like, a big protein. Okay, and they're what's so great about them is they're made by animals and they're made by humans to do a job of finding the proteins, finding the things. Okay, so this is antibody, uh, antibody medications are involved in or take sort of biology and use it to affect proteins and use it to help. Uh, a lot of people hear about fumarins all over the TV and some commercials. It's an antibody, um, the parent works for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's very excited. There's also uh, nucleic acid drugs now. Nucleic acid drugs, uh, one of the more, the, these are just now starting to come onto the market. Uh, they're involved in blocking like, the mRNA pathway and uh, either inhibiting or activating the, uh, the, the, the translation into proteins. Um, I won't talk too much about them, but that's a really, what's interesting about that is that is a growing field. Uh, we, there's now a handful of approved indications, and that's something that 10, 15 years ago was basically not heard. So um, there's your category of the drugs, and who knows, in five years there may be more categories here. So we have ourselves a target, we have ourselves an idea. Um, the next thing is to go into the, what, what I sort of generalize as the preclinical stage. And the goal in preclinical research, again, this is in, in models, animal models, or cell culture models is to demonstrate efficacy, which means that it works, not just in, and, you, and it can't just be in a dish now. Now you have to, you really should find an animal model of the disease, demonstrate the efficacy in the, in the dish, and then also demonstrate the safety profile of the drug. And a lot of times those studies are called non-clinical studies, if you ever read about a non-clinical study, that's a safety study, okay? Um, oftentimes these can be run concurrently, but there are very specific safety studies that are essentially required by the FDA in order to move on to the next stage and let it be for the people. These, uh, these studies take a little while and they cost a lot of money because they have to be done with exceptional rigor and, ex and uh, exceptional reporting because when you hand something off to a regulatory agency, they really don't want to be fed garbage okay? uh, because they're sort of holding your, uh, your life in there. For your, your uh, candidate's life. So that's a demonstrated animal model is that the drug is unlikely to be frankly dangerous when given to people. That doesn't mean it's not going to be dangerous or uh, untolerable. What it is going to mean is that it's not just something that's going to cause animals to explode on ingestion. You know, we don't want to prove that. 
try that. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit before we move on to the clinical stuff. We're going to talk briefly about our drug. Um, our drug is VA1049. Uh, it is uh, it is a ROC inhibitor. And what ROC is, ROC is a protein. It's a protein called Rho kinase, which uh, has been shown uh, over and over again to be a validated target in cavernous angioma, which means uh, we know that it is important to cavernous angioma. And we know that the inhibition of it uh, uh, makes the disease better, but it um, uh, decreases lesion burden and it can decrease the leakiness. Um, so, cavernous angiomas, as you guys know better than anybody, they're clusters of leaky endothelial cells, so the cells that line the, the, the uh, vasculature and capillaries. Um, if you, when you lose the CCM function, say whether you have a, a sporadic mutation or familial mutation in these endothelial cells, a lack CCM function. That results in low kinase activation. So now we have a target that's gone way up. Maybe we can try to turn it down. Uh, both the sporadic and familial forms of the disease uh, show rock activation in lesions. Um, and our drug is a little different than if you've heard about the Fazadil trials uh, or about Fazadil use in CCF. Um, rock uh, rock kinase is a kinase that has two isoforms. And the different, what that means is there's two proteins. They're kind of similar. Um, and they kind of do the same job. But they're in different tissues. They're expressing different tissues. So ROC2 is expressed in the brain and in brain endothelial cells, a place where we'd be very interested for CCM. Um, and it's less expressed in other places. And for instance, ROC1 is really uh, heavily expressed in, let's say, the lungs and, and the liver. Okay, so when we have a very specific drug, what um, our uh, VA1049 is more, more specifically targets ROC2, the advantages to that is that we can reduce the amount of um, off-target effects that you might have in the lungs and places because you're going to take this drug and I can't just apply this drug directly where it's needed. You have to ingest this drug. Uh, and so it's going to go all over the place. So you really want to avoid uh, off-target interactions. Um, okay, so rock inhibitors have the potential to reduce agentesis and restore normal endothelial cell barrier function. Um, so Here's a little uh, schematic for you. I'm going to probably grab a laser pointer for this. I'm going to try to project, okay, as I step away here so that I can. Uh, can everybody hear me if I step away from the mic? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, here is that endothelial cell attached tightly to its partners on either side of it. Uh, and there are a ton of proteins in a cell. A lot of times, cells are turned as bags of fluid with stuff floating in them. When really in reality, it's like everybody's, all these proteins are crammed in there and there's actually not a lot of like swimming pool space in there, okay? But in this schematic, um, we have ROC2 sitting here in the center and ROC2 responds to a bunch of different stimuli that I'm not necessarily going to dig into. But there's things like LPS, VEGF, TNF. And ROC2 is stimulated by these. And it turns out that the, the CCM proteins form a complex here. Um, so there's CCM1, CCM2, CCM3. And when they form this complex, they actually kind of, or this, uh, when they form this complex, they act as a brake, okay, on rocks activity. Okay, so they're sitting there and they're inhibiting, they're putting the brakes on. And what that means is that there's sort of a normal amount of activity around here and everything is normal. Now, if we have, if you have some sort of loss of function in the CCM proteins, say by perhaps having a mutation that knocks down the amount of CCM of one of the CCM proteins in there, you lose the soft sign. So all the time, all, all of a sudden, you've taken your foot off the brake, and ROC2 just gets to work. And when it gets to work, it's responding to the same stimuli, but now it's responding a lot more. It's making a lot of noise. And downstream of that, that affects these junctions between the endothelial cells, and it makes them kind of pull apart a little bit. And that pulling apart maybe might have, or could have something to do with the hemorrhages that everybody hears. But it also likely has something to do with these subhemorrhagic effects mm. that people talk about, which is it's not a frank hemorrhage. But and I've talked to a lot of a, a lot of patients I see faces around here that I, I recognize, but a lot of people say that they also sometimes just feel weird, right? Like it can be vertigo or it can be headaches or it can be dizziness. And a lot of times we hear that people then go to the doctor and they might even get scanned and the scan goes, I, I didn't see, it, it didn't, it, it wasn't brain hemorrhage. 
but there's something there, and we know that there's an increased permeability of these lesions. And not even just not having frank gushing hemorrhage, you can still have you can still have major effects of just a little bit of blood product leaking out. And so that's that's one of the hosts of this drug. So here's the A1049, the A1049 is an inhibitor of ROC2. And we put the brake back on, and hopefully everything returns to normal. Everybody good so far? Does anybody have any questions? Go back. Okay. When did I start? What was it, 150? Yeah. We're good. Yeah, we're here. We're here. We're fine. Time slows down and speeds up. Uh, okay, so here, here's, some here's some information about the A1049. Uh, it is orally available, so we're developing it as uh, something that you can take orally. Uh, in a lot of preclinical experiments from different labs done by different people, so with a fair amount with a lot of rigor, uh, the A1049 can reduce the leakiness of blood vessels in the brain, so taking up the blood brain barrier. Uh, also, in these preclinical experiments, 1049 uh, has been shown over and over again to reduce the incidences of uh, hemorrhages in the brain after stroke. So we can induce uh, a stroke in an animal model, and then we see a lot less energy after that stroke. Okay, so where do you guys come in? And uh, so this is a different way of looking at this that I have bolded out here. So the development it, for the development of these drugs, these studies are regulated very heavily, obviously by the FDA, by Health Canada, by the EI, depending on where you are. Um, even as early as early as possible, the suggestion is to start thinking of your clinical plan. And what that means is start figuring out how you're going to treat people, but more importantly, how are you going to run one of these well-controlled clinical trials that have the best chance of success, okay? And all the time we hear about drugs that go into clinical trials, and most drugs that go into clinical trials, those new drugs fail. Okay. And the tragedy is that some of those drugs probably work, just overall work, and would benefit people to receive them, get people that need them. But that the clinical trials that were designed were unable to show that benefit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. When you start a clinical trial, you have to say up front what you're going to measure and how much is significant. And the FDA has to agree on that to eventually approve. So I can't just give the drug to a bunch of people and then go, all right, well, you know what? We're just going to gather all the data, and at the end of the day, we're going to figure out what it's good at. That's not going to work. I think maybe in a perfect world, with an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of money, maybe that's what we do. And an infinite number of people willing to take part of a trial that's just a shotgun program. Um, maybe that would work. But in reality, you need to have an idea how your drug works, and you need to have an idea of what the needs of the patient population are in order to run these clinical trials correctly. So as early as possible, we start working on this clinical, clinical plan. Um, and on the other points here, regulatory guidelines are very heavy, and it should be. We're one of the few, uh, one of the few industries that actually really love the regulation that is placed upon them, because the only way people are going to trust any of this stuff is if it's very carefully controlled. Um, I think the airline industry is one of the um, and then, so once you have uh, a lot of the data, you can meet with the FDA and you can give them the data that you have and the questions that you have, and they can come back and they can tell you what the sort of things you need to show them safety or efficacy, mostly safety. The FDA actually doesn't care whether your drug works, they just want to make sure you're not hurting anybody by trying. Um, what sort of safety uh, data you need, what sort of experiments you can do to prove to them that it's got a good enough profile that you can try it in people. And then you submit an IMP, and I think Tim's going to talk about this maybe a little bit here. Um, but once you submit the IMP, the FDA looks at it, and it, it looks like it has a pretty decent profile. It's uh, unlikely to cause brain issues, predictable issues in humans, then they'll give you the right to go ahead and move into clinical trials. Okay? If I set this up right, the next slide is clinical trials. Now we're in people. Okay? Phase one. Where are people? This is phase one, and often it's a safety trial. I'm gonna 
put one little asterisk on this and say there are some creative ways to do combinations of phases here. And I might have an example. I do have an example in here. Um, so let's get down to it. But typically, a phase one is a safety trial of people in healthy volunteers. So now we are giving the drug to human beings, but we're not yet giving it to okay, people who actually need it. All you're doing is you're taking healthy people who are willing to take some cash in exchange for some risk, very carefully thought out risk, and demonstrate that it's safe and healthy volunteers. This is very important. It's a big step when you go first in hand because it means that we've gotten over one major hurdle. Um, Think about it. I'll come back to you. Let me know. Okay. Um, in some unmet needs, uh, much like angiomas, sometimes you can combine them into a phase one slash two A, which is both a safety and an efficacy trial. But those are in special circumstances, and it depends on a lot of other things that I'm not going to necessarily dive into right now. Um, so the purpose of these studies is to show the drug is tolerable in people at doses that are expected to be effective. This is another thing that. When we look at the science side of it, a lot of people don't consider the dose, mm -hmm. which is how much of this drug do you have to give to get the effect? Mm -hmm. Okay? I mean, if I can back a dump truck up over your mouth and pour something in there, um, it might be effective, um, but that's not going to work and it's probably going to be unsafe, right? If I dump a bucket load of water down the throat, I might kill you. So um, the poison is in the dose. So what we're constantly looking for is what's called a therapeutic window, which is. Mm -hmm. Where is the level where the drug is unsafe, hopefully way up here at the ceiling? And where's the level of the drug that we can give you that actually works? And hopefully we have this huge window to which to play with. If that net window is too narrow, it's like this, then you're gonna have a hard time giving one pill to everybody. You know, no matter whether they weigh 20 kilograms or 100 kilograms. So, um, so uh, and then also at the same time, at this point, uh, we're looking at how the human body absorbs, metabolizes, and excretes the drug. Because we've never seen it in people before, and it might be very different than what we've seen in animals. And so these data help demonstrate the doses, or help determine the doses that we examine in the next studies. Excuse me. Um, so the next stuff is the efficacy, phase two and phase three. Um, in general, they vary in the phase two is still to demonstrate safety, but also preliminary efficacy in usually a relatively small number of patients. Okay, so now we're actually getting into patients. The phase two trials that are being discussed most often and most likely in the case of Angiola are going to rely heavily on imaging. So if you spend any time with the researchers upstairs, there's a lot of talk about how we image the lesions and how we show that they're either shrinking or being less leaky or adding weight less or um, determining when something actually is a hemorrhage or when it isn't. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Phase three typically builds on that demonstration of efficacy. And you take it to a much broader group of patients. And at that point, what the FDA is really looking for is not only efficacy, like a pivotal amount of efficacy that shows that it works, and not only that it works with imaging, but that it's actually making a difference in people's outcomes, so that there actually is less of something or more of something. Um, and also that once you give it to a larger group of people, that um, there isn't some rare other thing that occurs in the population that interacts with it. Okay. Remember, we can combine these sometimes uh, in creative ways, especially in an underserved on that need, such as engineering. Okay. Here's the million dollar question. And this is really is probably a million dollar question. So if you have the answer, grab that. Um, how do we determine whether a drug is working? It's actually kind of hard to figure out. How do we know? I, I got a good look out of you, sir. How do you think we should decide whether a drug for angioma is working? That's you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. What? <laughs> no more please. Hey, no more please. Yeah. Okay. No more please. Shrink I think that's it. Quality, quality, Shrinkage. Shrinkage. Quality of life. Quality of life. Those are all three excellent answers, and they're all right to some degree. But see, this is what, to get back to what I was talking about, this is the issue, which is 
Well, just the farm, that's the biggest one. That's the big right there. <laughs> but this is what we come down to is we have to pick these endpoints. It's just we want it to be no bleeds. No bleeds sounds good to me. But what if all the bleeds that are happening are asymptomatic? We just produce a bunch of asymptomatic things, but over here there's this huge agents taking a whole bunch of room. People are starting to get sick from that. Um, yes, somebody raised their hand. So, yeah. if, if this drive goes through, not only would make these, but would it shrink uh, existing adenomas and get rid of those? And, and all I can tell you, and I guess that's a way to measure if it's working. Right. All I can tell you right now is that we have signal that suggests that it can do a lot of those things. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the issues that we need to address with the whole group of researchers and so forth is that we decide we, we don't want to lock ourselves into. This is the type of clinical trial that all the different drug candidates will work on because each drug candidate is different. Uh, Tim's going to talk about Tumbal is a different drug and it has different positives, maybe different negatives, maybe it's the perfect drug. But these clinical trial designs have to be designed very early on. We have to have these ideas. Um, so, uh, really briefly, imaging biomarkers are going to be very important. I'm actually going to move through this pretty quickly because I don't want to get too far on time, and you can get this. A lot of you probably are aware of this information. We can look at leakiness, we can look at past uh, hemorrhages with MRI. We can also look at this leakiness thing that I was talking about, which is this vague um, leakiness of blood products out of the, out of, out of the lesions that uh, many people believe are uh, responsible for a lot of the symptoms. Um, Here's one example of a really powerful imaging study. This is not from angioma, but this is from Alzheimer's disease. This is uh, Biogen's antibody, as you can do that. I that one without being ready for it. <laughs> All of these antibodies, when they only in math, or typically I did math or math. Um, but what they were able to show before they went to phase three to show that it was actually being effective in keep, keeping, this is actually a good demonstration of the difference between. Here they have uh, the baseline, and if you go from left to right, they gave the antibody that reduced <clears throat> that was supposed to reduce a beta plaques, which a lot of people think are, are a, a bad thing in Alzheimer's disease. And then the placebo, you see that there's a lot of the red stuff is a beta built up in the brain. You can see as they gave more and more drugs, more of that actually got cleared from the brain. Now that's awesome. And that's exactly what they wanted to see. But if they go to phase three, and a lot of Alzheimer's drugs do that, they show this great stuff in phase two. When they go to phase three, if they don't say not only does it do this, but that it actually helps people not decline as much in the Alzheimer's, then what's the point? I mean, we removed all the stuff. It's working. This is a group of biology. The drug's doing exactly what the scientists designed it to do. So if this goes to phase three and it's just can't believe it just isn't placebo, that's a problem. Okay, and this stuff happens all the time in Alzheimer's. It's like well, maybe we need to reformulate the idea of how the, how the disease works. And we go back to maybe we don't know how well the disease works. Okay. Uh, so, how can you help? Here we go. Ready? You have to be your own best advocate. The fact that you're here today means you're already on the set to do that. Okay. The Angioma Alliance is wonderful in that it has the weight of of a, a, a advocacy group for a much bigger disease. Okay, it's we're, we're sort of a rare condition here, but this is just so wonderful. And I've been part of a bunch of different disease areas. This is amazing. Okay, so you guys are already being your best advocates. Let's let's do a question because I know there's a, there's a lot of people in here. How many patients here have had a symptom or something that sent them to the hospital that started them down the angioma pathway that had the correct diagnosis the first time they went to a doctor? Okay. That's good. How many people didn't have the right correct diagnosis? Okay. So we're here and we understand how this works. Doctors are awesome, but being familiar with the signs and symptoms of every possible diagnosis is impossible. Okay. When you're dealing with a rare disease like this, if the doctor's never seen it before, they don't basically remember everything from medical school all the time. So you have to be your advocate, unfortunately. Um, has anybody ever gone to a new practitioner and had to go to the ER and then kind of had to fill them in 
on what's going on. Anybody have that experience? Oh, yeah. Look at that. All the time, still. Look at that. <laughs> I'm actually, I knew there would be people, but I didn't realize it was going to be this. I've heard stories of people saying they had to tell people to Google something in the emergency room. <laughs> yeah. That's frightening. It's right, right? But it's not. It's not a conspiracy. You know? <laughs> we got all of us in this room together and have the same experience as well. You know, with, with smartphones and health apps and all these things happening, I perceive that there could be a possibility where uh, your company, the Andrew Alliance, whatever, could download a, you know, a reasonable body of knowledge and have it be native to the health apps. You know? Because they're yeah. asking for our data yeah. and all this all the time, but they're not putting it together with any kind of real knowledge. So I'm just saying that. You know, it sounds like you're volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but it's like you're it's a great idea. for little bits of information, but never for the real story. It's a great idea. The smartphone thing would be nice to get like hands or something, right? Just if you're at a strange emergency room, if you're in El Paso, you're at a but a lot of times people haven't seen this stuff. This is leading up to something. I'm not just being raw, raw here. I'm going to bring it down. This. Um, okay. The other thing you can do is keep a journal. Who here keeps some sort of health journal? Good. It's a good idea just for everybody, you know, because then you can talk to your doctor and be informed and make decisions based on that stuff. Um, oh, there it is. Um, so. That helps you and then it helps your family if your family has to help you make decisions at some point. And it's also the more educated you are, the more educated your doctors actually end up being, and the more doctors would sort of swoop up in this movement, the better it is for everybody. Um, and it's also going to make sure that you remember the natural history of your experience for a long time. Um, another one, probably the most important one here, is be ready and willing to take part in the clinical trials when they come up. Because they're coming, they're happening right now. There's the sort of set and trial that there are going to be different trials that ask for different populations of people, perhaps with different symptoms or perhaps different histories. And it's not a huge community, it's a very tight community, it's a very powerful community. Um, but it's not so big that I can just go, hey, if you don't want to be involved, I'll find somebody else. It's not heart disease, okay? It's not something else where there's plenty of patients, okay? So the fact that you guys are here already probably means that you're not, that, that you're on board with that. And then obviously join the NGO Alliance Patient Registry because a lot of companies are going to lean pretty heavily on those resources in order to recruit patients. Um, okay. And this is the one that I came here to talk about. How much time do I have? Yes. Oh, thanks. Yes, go ahead. Oh, for the different phases? Well, so it's going to depend a little bit on uh, for each disease. It's going to depend, and if it is a rare disease or an unmet need or an orphan disease, you usually do smaller trials because there's less people. But they can bear, usually the um, healthy volunteers trial, the phase one trial, they can be pretty small down into like the, the, the tens to dozens, but they can, like, depending on how you design that trial. They can be bigger if you want to design that, but Everything is a cost benefit ratio, unfortunately, in the world. And so you could do a huge 200 person phase one, but that's going to cost you. Um, and then the phase two depends on how it's designed. Sometimes phase two trials can be really small, it can be a handful of people. And sometimes they have to be a lot bigger. It depends on the size of the effect you're looking for, um, how, how well the assay that you're looking at, how well the imaging works to actually. Determine that. And a lot of the decision making is doing these power analyses, which are the world most boring mathematics to do, but to figure out if the effect size is going to be this big, how many people do we need to be fairly confident that we're going to see that difference. And then for things like on the large side, for the phase three trials for the original statins and for heart disease and stuff, those are thousands and thousands of people followed for years. Um, and those are as you can imagine, extremely expensive from the pharmaceutical companies. Okay, so you can help us design clinical trials. I've talked to a lot of people, and I'll, let me give this from the start. I'm eating into my question and answer time, but this is worth it. 
We talked to somebody at the FDA. They said when we're dealing with a smaller disease community like CCN, we can read all the papers. And there are there are great papers. We heard about some of them earlier today. There's great research out there about the percentages of people with CCM that have recurring hemorrhage or seizure or stroke or numbness or this and that. And you end up with a chart, right? It says 87 percent, 70 percent, 35 percent. But distilling an actual patient experience down from that is difficult, right? Sometimes people's Symptoms develop over years. Sometimes they come on and come off. Sometimes they come on as for like a week and then go away, or they build and then they end up having a, a major event. And you lose that in the when you're looking at the forest, you don't see each individual tree. Okay. So on some of the patient experience can get lost in the way the research is presented. There's great value in that research, but there's other ways to look at it. So just, um, I think I just said that, but um, distilling the disease like angiomas and the symptoms and outcomes is extremely important. It's how good science is done. But there are details about the personal experience and about commonalities that we probably wouldn't have noticed in between patient experiences that can be lost in the sheer quantity of the details and statistics, okay? So to design a clinical trial that best addresses the needs of patients and therefore has the best chances of being successful it requires an understanding of the patient experience better than the average, or typical, or normal experience. Okay. Um, the most rewarding thing I've done at this job and perhaps in my career is talking to patients, family members, caretakers, um, yeah, of angio. It is a humbling experience. I appreciate it and I thank everybody I've talked to already, but it's also actually helping because we need to find a way to run a clinical trial that you guys would want to be part of and that will actually address the things that actually are affecting your outcome farther on, okay? So just because, let's say, the drug works on leakiness, well, if I can't show that that's giving some sort of benefit to you, then it's not going to work out, okay? So talking to you guys has helped us design this clinical plan earlier than probably we would have and I very much appreciate it. And I think this might be, yeah, basically the end. But I'm gonna, after all this is done at the next break, if you are willing to talk to me, if you want to share your experience, I anonymize it. And there's no, it was up. You can share as little or as much as you want. If you'd like to do that, I'd love to do it right now. But I'll, I'll take email addresses or something, and I'll be in contact with you because it's been absolutely wonderful. It has helped so much more than I've been able to. To, to get across to you guys right now. So some conclusions. I know I moved through our drug really rapidly, but I thought it was important to pick the stuff to help you guys the most right here, right now. Um, we're developing the A1049 for the treatment of Gavis angioma. Uh, the development of a new drug must be overtaken, must be undertaken with an eventual clinical plan in mind. That doesn't mean it has to be written in stone from day one, and it can change, and it certainly does change, um, but you have to have that plan in mind. And then the, an engaged and robust angiogenoma community, which we have, which is good, um, is beneficial throughout the development pathway a lot earlier than I think a lot of people do. Okay? And with that, if there's any time left, I'll be uh, happy to take questions. Yeah? Okay, go ahead. So, the average time between the places, how is that? Yep, uh, it can move quickly between the phases. Uh, a lot of companies will start and obviously be planning the next one while the one is in progress. Um, very commonly, it's uh, it's money. Uh, if you're a company that has infinite money, like, let's name one, advisors, infinite money source, um, then they do a lot of planning and they spend a lot of money to get multiple different ideas ready. And they get everything in place, and even if it, just in case it succeeds, and they can roll through these trials pretty quickly. But really, the limiting factor, sorry, the real limiting factor is how long of the trial are you going to have to run through the works. Um, for a while, when I first came to the Angioma community, the idea was that we're going to run a three year trial to see if the lesion number is reduced by a drug or lesion volume changes. Guys, a three year trial. For a new drug like this is probably not going to happen. 
because that's so much investment of resources. That's even just basically making that much drug for that long it is going to be difficult. Especially, and perhaps maybe that'll be in phase three, but these, these important imaging studies that are phase two, sort of like the, the atorvastatin trial. Nice thing about atorvastatin is it's there, right? It's already, it's safe, pretty safe. In a new drug like this, you're probably gonna need to demonstrate efficacy in a pretty short trial, okay? So in the area of months, or maybe even if we, if not, maybe we can define one that's really even less. Yeah, for financing, would it help if you broaden your patient population, like or maybe we are in a stroke or in an illness or something like that? Too. It, uh, it's tricky to do stuff like that because when you're uh, with a rare disease like this, uh, the FDA usually doesn't like you double dipping where you get all the um, the advantages of working in a rare disease. They give you like not having to do like two giant phase three trials. If you just turn around and say, okay, now that we got a group, we're gonna use it for stroke, something that is a lot more common, that they kind of frown on that. So usually you try to stick with um, one indication for one group. Yeah. What's your uh, time frame, you think, best case coming in the market? Best case? Yeah. Uh, it'll be years. Yeah. Three, five, ten. Uh, best case, probably, let's say, four. That's the best case, and that's what I'm going to do. Which I personally do not have. <laughs> uh, but there are opportunities um, on the horizon here. And it's business, and I can't talk about it, but we're encouraged. Good. Anybody else? Right, thank you guys very much. Find me if you're all done. Um, thanks again, Matt. That was a great presentation, a lot of helpful information. So we're going to keep going with drug development. Um, I want to thank our next speaker, Tim, here, who uh, being flexible this time. So I know we're running a little bit behind. And sorry to get more questions from Matt, but like you said, you can find him on break. He's going to talk to you, get his information out, and uh, hear your story, and you can reach out to him any questions. So moving along to our next speaker, uh, Tim Constantine. Is a senior vice president for strategic development at Recursion Pharmaceuticals as well as a licensing attorney. At Recursion, he is responsible for Recursion's development pipeline, including oversight of all preclinical and clinical activity, uh, licensing, and strategic partnership, and provides legal counsel to the company on all aspects of their business. Recursion's first drug development effort is the compound REC994, formerly known as Kimball which targets CCN and will be entering phase one trial shortly. Tim's work was critical in receiving orphan drug designation from the FDA, and we appreciate how closely he has been working with the NGM Alliance on all aspects of recursion's clinical trial design. So let's welcome Tim. Uh, fantastic, Tony. Thanks so much for the intro. Uh, thank you guys all so much for being here uh, to the Energy Alliance for sending the invitation to speak. Uh, this is a real pleasure for me. Uh, I really appreciate your time and attention. Don't hesitate to jump in at any time, interrupt me, throw things, uh, whatever, whatever needs to happen. Uh, it's all good. Um, Matt, thank you so much for a uh, great presentation. I think you really laid the groundwork. Uh, I'll try not to. It's reassuring, hopefully, for the audience somewhat that we're actually going to end up saying a lot of the same things. Okay. So, uh, everything he said was right. Um, uh, we did not collaborate before, we did not, we did not uh, work together uh, on the development of this. I'll try not to hit too hard on the things that Matt's already covered. Um, uh, essentially, uh, I want to, first of all, take a little bit of time just to kind of recapitulate. Um, Invitation to sincere is one of flattery, as they say, so I'm just going to imitate exactly what Matt said for the first couple of slides. I want to describe to you a little bit about what recursion, what our company is all about, and how we fit into the ecosystem of drug development. And then I kind of want to walk you through some of the work that we've done specifically on our compound. And to it actually dovetails really nicely with the concepts of, that Matt introduced. 
and kind of shows you kind of specifically for this particular compound, what kind of work is involved in getting into the clinic, and then some thoughts again about how you can move forward from this particular point in time. So if you go to the mass internet, that drug development you get some really cool answers. It involves a whole lot of really attractive young people with brightly colored liquids. Um, <laughs> so it's really important. This is the first big takeaway. You've got to have some turquoise in beakers. Uh, so that's super important. And then you throw in more turquoise. It's about scrubs and masks and bubbly things. And then ultimately you need a terrifying rabbit. <laughs> uh, that is essentially what the R part of R and D is all about. It's it's precisely what Matt said. You start off in a dish, you move into animals, you kind of show that there's some that you're hitting a target that you're doing something good in a biological system, and you move to increasingly more complex biological systems. You start off with single cells in a dish, then move maybe you move to kind of organoids or more complex cellular systems. And then you'll move into animals to demonstrate that you're actually doing something that you want to do in biology. Once you get past the research stage, then you kind of shift gears and move into development. And again, what you need is more animals. So you give, uh, it's generally to, to fulfill the regulatory requirements, you need to show it's safety in a rodent and a non-rodent species. That's generally kind of the baseline requirement. Um, rat and dog are the two most common kind of animal species. Um, a lot of people, there are mini pigs and rabbits and large pigs and medium sized pigs and non human primates, a whole bunch of different kind of species that are used. We specifically use rat and dog for our preclinical programs because their systems most closely mimic those of humans. And it's important to kind of emphasize, I think, that. You can do all the experiments in a dish that you like, and you can do all the experiments in animals that you like. But biology is just stupidly complex. And as you can tell, and as I'm sure you know, listening to the news and looking at the way drug companies operate, even if you show fantastic data in a dish or in animals, by the time you get to humans across the industry, you only have somewhere in the region of about a 9% chance of success. So the models that we the, the state of the art, the very best models that we can create uh, in cells and in animals are very, very poorly predictive of what's going to happen in humans. And I've got a really specific example of that with respect to Temple, um, or Rep994, the company, are the, are the compound that we've been working on. So again, you put it into animals, it's really simple to start development like You stick it into animals and then you put it into humans. <laughs> and then you make cold loads of cash. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not... I'm, Look, I understand that this is a patient community, and I understand that I'm coming from industry, and there's maybe an inherent kind of tension there. Um, and I raise this point deliberately and specifically because it takes, in answer to your question, sir, it takes, you know, historically it takes between 10 and 15 years to get through this process, as described here. There's a very, very low chance of success. And if you divide the amount of money that's spent on drug development across the industry, by the number of new drugs that actually get approved, you end up with a number of about $2.6 billion per drug to wow. get it from one end of this process to the other. So between 10 and 15 years and a couple of billion dollars. Now, there's a massive variance in the, in the amount of money it takes for any individual program, right? For a small rare disease, if you've got small study sizes and small study durations, you're gonna be on the much lower end of that. But, Industry-wide, and as an average, we're looking at two and a half billion dollars to get something into the hands of the people who need it. So something's broken here, right? And in the advent of personalized medicine, and with the advent of greater interest in rare diseases and smaller patient communities, you can imagine that that's not going to work, right? There are seven thousand rare diseases out there. NIH has calculated that we would actually bankrupt the country if we ended up spending two and a half billion dollars to cure 70,000 diseases. And those are only the rare diseases. So there's something kind of fundamentally flawed here. And that's kind of the thesis of what recursion, what my company is all about. We want to kind of change that. We want to apply technology, we want to apply automation, we want to kind of marry the cutting edge, the leading edge of technology with life sciences. And biology to change the way this happens. Um, to get companies involved, to get money into this space, you've got to shorten timelines, you've got to reduce costs, 
And ultimately, for smaller disease populations, you've got to you've got to prove to the investment community, you've got to prove to the funders that you're going to be able to make some money out of this. And this is the horrible kind of tension that you have between people's lives and people's suffering and capitalism. But it's the truth, and that's the world in which we live. So we're all kind of charged, I think, with trying to make the system better, with trying to bring more diseases into the financially remunerative bucket that will incentivize companies to come in and actually do the research and do the innovative science and the creative uh, research and development that are, that's needed to do this. Because after all, as I, I'm gonna say it again and again, biology is really complex and we do things the best we can, given the information we have, but we're wrong 90% of the time. Um, very, very briefly, what, what Recursion wants to do is, is it's essentially facial, rec facial recognition for cells. So we start off, we take pictures of cells, we break a gene, and in this case we broke CCM2, one of the genes that we believe is responsible for CCM. And when you break the gene in the cell, the cell changes. It causes a morphological change in the cell. It causes all sorts of different changes in the cell. What we do is we measure about a thousand different parameters in the cell. And we, put, and we compare that changed cell to the healthy state. So we can actually quantify it. We can actually calculate mathematically the difference between the sick state and the healthy state. And then when you pour a drug on the sick cell, you can actually measure and quantify how well it rescues back toward the healthy state. And that's kind of the central thesis. That's the core technology of our company. And we're doing this across hundreds and hundreds of rare diseases, but CCM has been, uh, it's been at the forefront of our company. It's what gave us our genesis in the first place, and it's our lead, uh, and it's our lead uh, program to date. So what we do is, as Facebook does it right to tag people in photographs, all sorts of tech companies do facial recognition, and we do the same thing. So a few years ago, scientists demonstrated that you could actually diagnose some rare diseases by taking photographs of patients' faces. And the space between the eyes, the, the ratio of the nose to the chin, these are all very idiosyncratic and unique to specific diseases, and you can actually just use a computer to take pictures of the patients' faces and be able to diagnose them. So we do that, but essentially at a cellular level. We take pictures of the cells, we characterize and we create a unique kind of fingerprint, cellular fingerprint for the disease, and then we measure which drugs uh, can be used to rescue that back to health. Once we've done that, then we kind of adopt a more traditional approach and we hand off the compounds, the drugs that we think look like rescue in these cellular models, we hand them off and into the hands of other scientists that kind of confirm that and then look at animal models. And so we do in vitro and in vivo confirmation testing uh, of what we find on our platform. And then if things still look like they rescue them, then you hand it off to me and I take them through the process that, that Matt described earlier. So in the past four years, we've generated uh, leads and programs around about 30 different programs. And as you can see highlighted in the red box, CCM is our furthest advanced and it's one that we're really, really excited about. So let's get into the specifics of what happened for CCM. So to get back to kind of just to reorient ourselves and where we are in the process. So the past couple of years, we spent time in this red box, in the preclinical space. And the, the distinction that Matt drew between preclinical and clinical, I think, is, is kind of emphasized here, and it's really, really important. Um, historically, this takes you know three to six years, five to ten million dollars to get through kind of this, this, this process. And you can see there's a massive attrition. For every 10,000 compounds that starts at the beginning of this, one ultimately makes it uh, through to the end. So that's, that shows you how good we are, or how bad we are at doing this, right? Um, and we want to um, we want to change the way that happens. But this is the world in which we live, right? Um, I think somebody earlier asked a question about what, how, how many numbers of patients are typically involved. And Matt hit the nail on the head, right? So phase one early studies are typically in tens of patients. The proof of concept phase two studies that first begin to show efficacy in humans they can be tens or hundreds of patients. Uh, and then larger phase three studies are typically in thousands of patients. And I've worked on, I've worked on studies that have enrolled 10,000 patients. And I think you've probably heard about sort of the Sorrento drug for Duchenne muscular dystrophy that got, that got approved essentially in a 12 patient cohort. So it really runs the gamut. Um, for rare diseases, the rules, there's more flexibility about it from a regulatory perspective. Um, and simply because there aren't enough patients to run these massive studies, then we're forced to kind of be creative. Um, and again, it really depends on what you're trying to measure, 
how big the study needs to be. So to get to a clinical trial, you essentially have to check all the boxes that I've highlighted here. So you start off with preclinical development, you have all your cellular work, you have all your animal work, and you generate a dossier of information surrounding that work, and you hand it off to the FDA, and they give you the AMA as to whether you can kind of proceed to, to human clinical studies. And the major categories involved there, you gotta be able to show that there's some suggestion that the drug's gonna work, so that's efficacy. And that's kind of broken down into the primary pharmacology, is it hitting the target that you want it to hit? Secondary pharmacology, is it hitting other targets that maybe you don't want it to hit? Safety, that's the real emphasis of our preclinical programs to demonstrate this is safe for use uh, in humans. There's general toxicology, Does it? Is there a toxic liability? Does it affect the organs in a, in a bad way? Um, safety pharmacology is part of that. Genetic toxicology, is it going to cause damage to your DNA? Is there carcinogen? Pharmacokinetics is an interesting concept. So there's two things that you can probably kind of bear in mind about thinking about how drugs interact with people. There's one, what does, what does the drug do to the body? And that's efficacy. Is it doing to the body what you want it to do? And the other thing is, what does the body do to the drug? And that's essentially pharmacokinetics, or PK. So how does it get absorbed? How does it get distributed throughout the body? How does it get metabolized by the body? And then ultimately, how is it excreted? And that's what that's what pharmacokinetics is all about. And you, as you might imagine, you have to understand that pretty well before you start experimenting with humans. Because this is exactly what we're doing. They call it clinical trials, but it's experimentation on humans. And uh, so we've got to be very, very careful. We've got to have the, the most rigorous and kind of, kind of highest level of ethical oversight um, before we kind of embark on this step. And then, of course, you've got to be able to make the thing. You've got to be able to manufacture it. You've got to be able to make pills or injections or IV bags or whatever. Whatever route of administration you want to use, you've got to be able to demonstrate to the FDA that you can make this thing consistently, that you can make it in an unadulterated fashion, that there's no kind of you know, rat droppings or flies or, you know, you know, you've seen them in your salads, you've seen them in restaurants. You've got to make sure that that kind of stuff uh, is in your drug product as well. And then ultimately, you got to, you know, as Matt highlighted, you've got to kind of start with the end in mind. So all of this work, all of this animal work, all this work in dishes and rats and dogs and monkeys and what have you, it's all to support ultimately what the clinical program will look like. So if you want to be able to dose people for six months, you have to be able to demonstrate in this part of the process that it's safe to dose people for six months. So starting off with efficacy, with respect to Tampol, um, what we did, Kind of was described here. It was a four-stage process. We, we started off with a library of 2,100 compounds, and we screened it using our platform, and we created this unique cellular fingerprint of, of the disease. And that, we knocked down CCM2, the cells changed shape, we measured that, and then we poured a bunch of drugs on them with C -Cruit and to determine which drug changed uh, the cells back toward and looking for normal. So that was kind of the first stage. And all of the 2100 compounds that we screened, 36 to 38 uh, looked like that they rescued uh, on, this, uh, on a cellular level. Then we next, next asked the question. So one of the issues with CCM, I think that was my highlighted, is you get this kind of super leaky uh, blood vessels in the brain, right? You get the junctions between the cells that don't work, right? So we created a cellular model to test that and looked at the cell barrier function in a dish. And uh, were the drugs that we were looking at able to restore that cellular barrier? Were they able to kind of impede and all, the passage of an electrical current from one side of the cell to the other? And the longer it took for the electrical current to go through, the better the barrier was. If you're looking for a good barrier, you want to stop the leukemia, you want to stop the occult blood. And so that was kind of the second test that we looked at. Then we went into mice and we said, Let's look at this permeability issue a little bit more. And we looked at dermal permeability in mice as a surrogate for permeability in the brain. And we asked the question, were we able to rescue a defect that was created in the mice that created permeability in the skin? And once we did that, of the seven compounds that went in, it looked like two compounds came out and rescued in all of these. And then eventually we ended up in a mouse model of the disease we think basically we capitulate what the human disease looks like. So there's a lot of lesion development in these CCM2 knockout mice. 
Uh, but you look at the lesions themselves, they look very, very similar just a pathologically to human lesions. And we saw a pretty significant uh, reduction in the number of lesions in the mass model. So some of the data, it's a very, very brief, I'm not going to bore you, but one, you can see that there's a statistically significant difference between the treated mice and the untreated mice and the number of lesions. So uh, the black are the untreated mice, uh, the white bars are the treated mice, and across the lesion size, we see far fewer lesions in mice treated with example. With respect to number two, blood vessels are elastic, right? They, they expand, they contract depending on the stimuli that they receive. Uh, one of the issues in CCM is that blood vessels don't react that way anymore. They've lost their plasticity, their, their ability to react to volume changes in the blood vessel. So we created a model that looked at that, and we saw that Tempo was able to restore completely a defect in that elasticity. And then finally, from the from, from the skin permeability experiment, we can see that Tempo actually restores uh, the skin permeability defect back toward the wild type of the normal state. So we were pretty encouraged by this data. We saw orthogonal and a validation of our results in three or four different now uh, models of the disease, and we decided this was worth our while to try to advance uh, into the clinic. We understand very, very briefly what Tempol does is that when you lose, so the, the protein complex that Matt referred to is kind of in the top left here. There are three CC, through CCM genes, you get this primary protein complex. If you lose one of them, then you get a down regulation of a compound called FOXO1. You get a down regulation of an enzyme SOC2 or superoxide using those two. And what that means is that you get a buildup of reactive oxygen species or free radicals in the cells of the, of, of the brain's blood vessels. Um, the loss of these CCM genes does a whole host of things. It does exactly what Matt said it does with respect to real kinase. You get a buildup of these kind of superoxide anions, and there's a, there's a whole host of different effects. Um, because different drugs target different things doesn't mean one is right, one is wrong. It just means that there are different targets and that they're, they're both contributing, can, contributing to the disease. What Tempol does essentially is that it, it soaks up all those additional uh, reactive oxygen species or these free radicals in the blood vessels of the brain and it essentially just kind of calms them down. Um, it restores the barrier function of the blood vessels in the brain, we think, at least according to the animal models. And it decreases the likelihood that there will be an inflammatory process around these lesions due to the presence of blood outside the blood vessels. There's a cold blood outside the lesions, kind of recruits inflammatory processes and inflammatory mediators, and essentially just keeps the lesions angry, I suppose, and increasingly weak. And what we're trying to do and what we think Tempol does is just essentially just kind of keeps things quiet. And hopefully that will result in a couple of different things. Hopefully, it will result in a reduction in release. And Mike talked about this. I think there's kind of a general consensus around the idea that if you can prevent bleeds going forward, that's going to be beneficial. Um, there is a, there's, there's always this massive question about lesion formation. Um, I don't know that we can say that we have an effect on lesion formation or not yet. We haven't done those experiments, um, but it's a question that we love to answer moving forward. Um, Tempol, the, the molecule itself has been well characterized, it's been around for decades. Please don't try to read this. Um, the reason it's up here is just to say that this is a very, very well characterized compound. It does a whole lot of different things to the body and it's very, very well understood. Um, and that's and that's why we're that's why we're pretty confident about introducing it into humans. There's been a whole lot of research done uh, on this over decades. So we know it's a really known quantity and we know what we're dealing with. Um, Moving past efficacy and kind of focusing on safety, safety is exactly what Matt described it to be. It's this therapeutic window. And I swear we didn't we didn't collaborate on this at all. So this line here kind of describes how much you need of the drug in the blood to do what it is that you want it to do. So you need to get over this line and stay under this line. You start getting side effects, adverse events, bad things start happening here. And you want to be able to create a constant kind of concentration in the blood uh, in this space. And the larger that gap is, the better. Um, and what we've been able to demonstrate through our toxicology studies, and we've done up to 28 day tox studies in rats and dogs, is that uh, Tempol has a really, really significantly large therapeutic window. 
so we can afford to dose at a therapeutic level without, we hope, running the risk of creating an adverse event or having a bad safety profile. So we've done single dose, maximum tolerated dose studies. We actually couldn't give the rats enough tenhol to induce a clinical and a negative effect. We gave them a thousand milligrams per kilogram and they were just jumping around like you know, this business. So, um, so, 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 so we were pretty pleased with that. We did multiple dose, we did seven day dose range finding study, and then it, uh, ultimately we ended up doing uh, multiple 28 day uh, target studies. Uh, we came through with a pretty team patch profile, so we're, so we're pretty excited about that. We did a full genetic toxicology package, and again, gene tox is about whether your compound is going to interfere with your DNA, whether it's going to mess with your um, uh, chromosomes, whether it could create any kind of mutation in your DNA, lead to susceptibility to cancer, this kind of stuff. If you're if you're going to dose people for a long time, so we anticipate that that temple would be a kind of a daily chronic uh, administration for the rest of the patient's lives. Then you've got to be able to have a really clean bill of health when it comes to cancer predisposition and things like that. And we uh, uh, and we have your genetic tox kind of solution. So again, uh, another good signal. And then safety pharmacology. You want to look if you're going to expose the entire organism to a drug. You want to make sure that some of the core uh, systems aren't affected. And typically what you look at when you're looking at safety pharmacology is you look at the heart and the cardiovascular system. Are you, do you have an effect on the heart? Um, many drugs out there have what's called herd liability. They cause kind of arrhythmias in the heart. They cause the heart to beat uh, irregularly, and that's very, very dangerous. Um, Tempo has no such liability. You want to look at the lungs and the pulmonary system and make sure that your ability to breathe and to oxygenate the blood um, isn't, uh, isn't affected, and again, we had a clean bill of health there. And then ultimately, you want to look at the brain um, to see if there's kind of any cognitive uh, impacts of your drug, to see if it uh, you know, affects any of the kind of core systems, control systems in the brain. So you do a whole panel of these, and we did that, and we got a um, mass with flying colors, uh, I'm pleased to say. PK, I described to you, I think, briefly. This is, this is what it looks like when you take a drug, a single dose, orally. It goes in, it gets absorbed out of your blood vessels, into your tissues, into the rest of your body. It peaks at a certain point, and then it starts getting broken down. It gets metabolized by the liver and the kidneys, um, uh, and is ultimately excreted. And you might imagine that when you take a drug every day, then you get uh, what looks like the graph on the right. So you'll get a peak and a trough and a peak and a trough. And again, you want to keep that kind of constant steady state concentration of the drug between those two guardrails, high enough to be able to have an effect and low enough not to cause that persistence. Uh, and the profile, the PK profile that we generated uh, for Tempo uh, in animals looked, looked really, really good. Um, uh, but I'm just reminded of, of a point I wanted to make. So one of the things we measure when we look at PK is what's known as the half-life of the drug. So how long does it take for the concentration of the drug to kind of fall to half its maximal concentration? In animals that looked like, it would, for example, it looked like it was about 25 minutes. Really, really quick. It just goes in and out, and you're done. That kind of gave us a little bit of pause for thought about dosing and you know, how we would get exposure. Um, we just got back the first human PK data, and the profile looks really good. The half-life of that six hours. So it's got a much lower peak and a much longer kind of exposure. Um, so that's actually really good news. But it just goes to show you that despite your best efforts and what you do in an animal, it's not necessarily going to be predicted of what happens in people. And there's you are so there's a trillion cells in here. Like how how could you tell what it's going to be like? And the cells are very different, the enzymes are very different, the proteins are very different in humans than they are in animals. So uh, we gotta be we just gotta be aware that there's a big change when we go from the pre clinical to the above steps. Um, uh, as far as manufacturing goes, we can make it. This is what it looks like. Um, this is actually a picture of our uh, the bottle on uh, on the left. is actually the clinical trial material for our first clinical study. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. And then we're also developing uh, a tablet formulation. And I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but there's a very small uh, white tablet uh, there. 
Um, so we're fortunate in that it's a really easy drug to make. Um, we can make it in kilogram quantities. It's, we can make it reproducibly. We can make it according to GMP from the manufacturing practice. Um, so, so far so good on the CMC front. And then once you assemble all that information that we just talked about, you put it in what's known as the IND or the investigational new drug application. You give it to the FDA and they have 30 days to review it. And if you don't hear from them, and they have no questions at the end of that 30 days, then you have what's known as a cleared IND and you can actually commence clinical studies. Um, so we were fortunate enough to have gotten to that point and we, excuse me, we filed our IND um, on June 3rd uh, of this year. Uh, we got practically no questions back from FDA and we got our study may proceed letter on July 3rd uh, of this year. And between July and a couple of weeks ago, we scrambled to put together the first uh, clinical study for a temple in humans. And let's just talk about that. So this is a healthy volunteers, just like Matt indicated, it's very, very common um, for development to begin in, uh, in healthy volunteers. And this is what we did. Um, the study that's currently ongoing and I literally got off the call an hour ago, uh, and let me see. We were discussing that we are right here in this process. So on the 24th of October, we dosed our first two sentinel subjects. So we dosed one active and one placebo. We monitored those patients for 24 hours to make sure they're safe, to make sure there's no adverse events, that their labs look good. And then we decide whether we whether we, uh, whether we dose the rest of the first cohort. And so what we do in the single ascending dose, we give a patient a dose of the drug. And in the same way we did with the animals, we started off with a single dose and then went to seven days and then went to 28 days. It's very similar, you gotta do the same thing in humans. So we're starting off here with a, with, with, with a single ascending dose cohort study. So we started dose level X, whatever we decide is, is a safe dose. We dose eight patients for eight day and then we look at all their safety and their PK review and make the determination whether it's safe and appropriate to go on to the next dosing level. And the next dosing level is twice what the first is, and then on to twice that again, and then twice that again. Um, so we are, as I say, we are right here in this process, and everything looks good so far. And we anticipate completing dosing uh, at this final cohort in mid January. So we will demonstrate hopefully at that point that a single dose of Campbell in humans is safe and tolerable, and we'll be able to get a good idea of what the body, what the human body is actually doing to the drug um, when it comes to pharmacokinetics. The next stage, the next step that we will go to is do this, but again, the difference here being instead of one day, it'll be multiple days. Uh, we haven't yet decided what that number will be yet. Um, but the plans are in place to run the study. It's a very similar study design. So we use single day, multiple days. And then at that point, then I think we would uh, consider going into, uh, going into the patient population. And there's a number of reasons to do this. And Matt highlighted it, stole my thunder a little bit, but it's all about dose, right? It's all about figuring out what the drug does in humans as opposed to what it does in animals. We have an idea of what a therapeutic dose is from our mice study, but really we can't. We can't go on that alone. We have to get a sense of what's safe in humans. And so we dose multiple times across multiple doses to get a dose range that's safe and tolerable in humans. And then we can kind of marry that with what we know about could be a therapeutic dose. And then potentially we'll be able to move into uh, patient studies. Tony, are you, how am I doing on time? Yeah, we have okay. question. Um, I have a question about, um, I read something the other day about uh, Alzheimer's, they're doing some kind of AI to predict who's going to get it. Um, is anybody doing anything uh, with this disease to predict who's going to get it or who's going to have a good day in addition to treating? Yeah, so uh, there was a poster at the poster session last night. There's a company called, called Benevolent AI, and um, I'm not sure if the posters are still up or not, but they're looking at doing kind of literature based searches using their AI engine to predict who the best patients would be. 
um, for a whole variety of diseases, CCM in particular. So there is some thought as to how that would work. Um, that is not part of what we're doing. Our AI is much, much earlier in the process. But yeah, yeah, I think people are thinking about it. <coughs> yeah. Um, are you going to be using it for CCM? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We anticipate that this will be for all comers, irrespective of what the implementation will be. How does this right differ from um, the one that we were just hearing about the, the BA? Sure. Uh, so that remains to be seen, right? So um, BA 1049 is a very specific target uh, in in Rock Two. Um, we have a we have a very different target. Whether it ends up mediating the same effect in patients kind of remains to be seen. We don't know yet. That's the whole kind of ball of wax. Yes. Targeting yep. Wait. <clears throat> yes. You anticipate we're working the authentic sporadic and the famous abnormalities and gene changes or just genetic changes? So that these are questions that we come to this meeting to try to answer, right? Um, so there was there was conversation earlier in last presentation about how big these sample sizes need to be. We did some kind of back of the envelope calculations a long time ago and if you quote me on any of these numbers, I'll deny any point. Um, <laughs> I guess this would enjoy that. <laughs> Stop talking. Um, uh, I think you saw in Dr. Um, uh, in Dr. Solomon's talk this morning that the background rate of hemorrhage generally in all comers, if you look at the disease broadly, is about 0.5% per year, right? If that's the effect that you're looking at, and you want to make a difference in that, and you took everybody and you involved anyone that wanted to come in, and you said that if we could reduce that by half, that's clinically meaningful. Let's just say for argument's sake, that was it. I think you'd need 8,000 patients to be able to figure out if that was a true difference or not. So that's at one end of the spectrum, right? If you take familial patients with brain stem leads 12 months after an initial hemorrhage, and you have somewhere in the region of about a 30% chance of a relief, which I think is what the paper said that was presented this morning. So if you've gone from trying to measure an effective 0.5% to an effective 30%, that brings you down, I don't know, probably to patients in the tens. And so it's a question of how many of those really specific patients are there? How many of those non-specific patient groups are there? And where is the sweet spot? What levers do we what levers do we want to pull um, to kind of get the right spot? So, yeah, but, yeah, but let me just add to that. The one message that we want to get across though is that even if the trial population is a very narrow population, I am on those, that does not mean that the eventual treatment population will be just that narrow group. Yep. These right. same drugs should work for anybody with hemorrhage who has who is at risk for hemorrhage, which is pretty much anybody with a lesion in the brain. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, that, I was going to say the exact same thing. And how important yeah. that is. Just because you're planning a, a narrow clinical trial doesn't mean it's not going to be able to be described to one month long. So that's Hopefully, I mean, that's really the point about design. Clinical trial is not necessarily restricting it forever. Yep. And, and, and you have to, and it's, there is just one quick comment about irrespective of the disease, the patients that get involved into clinical trials are defined by inclusion exclusion criteria always. And those are always a really kind of homogeneous subset, artificial subset of the patient population. And it, then it Drugs always end up getting used in these larger patient populations. That's just the nature of the beast. We have to figure out the most cost effective, time efficient way to kind of demonstrate to the regulators that whatever drug it is, whether it's ours or Matt's or someone else's, the need is to get something in the hands of patients. So let's figure out the best way to do that and the quickest way to do it. Um, and I think by asking the questions we've been asking for the past couple of days, that's how we can get to those answers and that's how you get to the point of those groups that we study to help everyone. 
So do you, do you foresee this as a medicine they'll have to take every day? I mean, would you for maintenance and something that you might just take every so often or just if they, you, you may reverse the process or I guess what do you think? Yeah, that's a great question. Our, our current best understanding of how we think this will play out is that it would be a, a daily chronic dose. Like, like, I'm not going to say aspirin, but along those kinds of lines, right? We hope to be able to demonstrate that this is going to be really, really safe um, and that will have a very low side effect profile. Side effect profile. I don't know that that's going to be the case. It may not pan out. This, this may fail. As I shared, any drug that gets to this point still only has a 90% chance of success, generally speaking. Um, but yes, it would. That's, the, that's how we're thinking of this. Yeah. I'm hearing quite a bit um, in these different presentations about imaging biomarkers. And I'm wondering um, if those tests are just images that the people doing the drug trials can conduct, or like just a regular patient can go to the lab and get one of those imaging tests that to be more specific about the people. We're going to have a presentation later in the day from Amy Akers, um, and she can she can oh, okay. give a talk to that for a while. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have one more question. Oh, please. If these drugs reduce the ability for these to bleed, couldn't it also reduce the size at the same time? It's it's entirely possible. It's absolutely possible, but we haven't done the experiments. I, I would be I would be irresponsible to say anything more than that. We just don't have the data to say. But yes, it's entirely possible. It's also entirely possible that they. And I think this worked out nicely. This is kind of my. This is just what well, what has happened so far. Um, we started really actively working on this in the beginning of 2017. We're about 18 months to our IND. We're a little into our second year now uh, to begin dosing, uh, uh, which happened a couple weeks ago. What we're thinking is that it looks something like this, as I've described, a single ascending dose study, a multiple ascending dose study, and then a phase two uh, proof of concept. Uh, and then depending on how, you know, what the agency says, what the FDA says, what the quality of the data, the quality of the data is, there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, the vast majority of rare diseases end up getting approved on either a single phase three study or a combination phase two, phase three study. The timeline is generally abbreviated. The patients that patient numbers that need to participate are generally smaller, but you can't kind of generalizations are always wrong, uh, as they say. Um, but we like to think that um, we like to think that we'll be able to get this thing uh, kind of into the hands of patients sooner than kind of tradition or historical data would suggest. Um, I'm really grateful to all of you for coming out. But thank you so much for the fantastic questions. It's really great to meet all of you, and uh, I'll be around for it. Yep. What's, what's your best case on the pitch so you depart from where you're at? So, um, the sign will be the end of uh, the beginning of next year, the single ascending dose uh, at the end of Q2. We would imagine beginning the multiple ascending dose in Q2, that will take about a year. I would imagine we'll get into phase two in probably 2020. So I worked on a I worked on a compound a long time ago for a disease called short bowel syndrome. It's an orphan disease. It took us two years to enroll 200 patients. Um, you know, to Matt's point, it really depends on how long that the treatment duration is. Are you going to be able to measure efficacy in three months, six months, a year? Um, then the other wires start getting really, really big, right? As, as you can imagine. Um, you know, if everything goes well, you know, we could get approval on a phase two for a limited patient. Who, who, who knows? But the short answer, and uh, Tony introduced me as, a, as an attorney, and I think I really wanted to put that out on and say, it depends. <laughs> um, but it will be years. Thank you so much, folks. So, um, the, we're, uh, 
We're running a little bit behind, and upstairs they're getting ready to break for the day. And I'm wondering if you guys wanted to go up and share a last break with, with the researchers and say goodbye. If there's anybody there that you still want to want to talk to, because we could break right now and then come back and reassemble it. We have three, three, ten. It's only a screen network for you guys. Okay. All right. See you guys. We'll take a longer break. This is a lot of time. Okay. Three, ten. Okay. I mean, it was a great time. I mean, it was a great time. What you say? I said, what's the feeling? Yeah, I know. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. It's a distraction. Yeah. Watch them there. You have to choose your work. When he was messing with the lights, though, it's very uncomfortable here. I can't put your eyes. That's what no, that's not true. That's right. I was wondering too, because nobody's thinking. 